Good morning, everybody, or rather it's good afternoon, almost, because um, for many people it's been uh, on the go since 7.30 this morning. Um, my name's Nick Gowing. I'm, uh, I used to be on television. I used to work for the BBC, but I'm now um, the found, founder and director of Thinking the Unthinkable. And that's, I think, why I'm here, because I want to encourage you. And by the way, could we have the lights up on the audience, please? Could we have the lights up? so we can see you, and I've got a reason for that. Um, I, want you, I want to think the unthinkable here, because we are described as an opening plenary, but as I've said to all the four panelists, and of course many of you, we've been going for more than 24 hours now, so actually, what are we opening? So what I want to do is consolidate and move forward on a lot of the issues which you've already been engaged in in various sessions, uh, very dynamic sessions already uh, around this conference center. And I'm going to give you a two-minute warning now. I'm going to come to you to ask the questions, um, because I want you to help create the agenda for our guests here um, so that we can get to the cutting edge, uh, where the cutting edge is now on globalization. Notice it's about rebirth of globalization, which raises an extraordinary number of questions about can you give rebirth to something called globalization, or what kind of globalized world do we need now to keep the public on side, particularly the disaffected, who are causing so much difficulty in so many parts of the world in a way which is being exploited by political leaders and also corporate leaders as well. These are complex times. I just put that on the agenda. What kind of rebirth are we talking about? And that's what we hope to hear from the panel with big ideas, unthinkable ideas, or let me refine that a little bit, thinking the unpalatable. Because much of what is happening now, we couldn't get on the agenda this time last year. But look what's happening. And I didn't say Brexit, but I will now. I come from a dysfunctional country. And uh, Jose Manuel Barroso lives at the heart of it and is watching it all. Uh, and it feels like an unreal nightmare. But were we prepared to predict that a year ago? There's still that pushback. There's still, in a place like Britain, and in, in places like Hungary and Poland, and to a degree in, in France, there is still that questioning of the, the normal political system in which globalization is taking place. It, it's happening in the Far East as well, uh, as well, um, in, in, and you can see enormous changes taking place. So I'm giving you time to think of your questions now. The microphones are ready, and I'm now going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. Anne Winblad, first of all. Good morning, I'm Ann Winblad. I am the co-founding partner of Hummer Winblad Venture Partners, a venture capital firm based in San Francisco. We were the first venture capital firm to invest exclusively in software, and over the last 30 years, we've launched over 200 software companies. Jose. Thank you, my name is Jose Manuel Drom Barroso. I'm Portuguese. Um, I've been in politics since many years. I was deputy foreign minister, foreign minister, Prime Minister of Portugal, then I was two, year, two mandates, 10 years, President of the European Commission. I left politics in 2014, and now I am a visiting professor at Catholic University here in Lisbon, I'm a visiting professor in Geneva, and I am also non-executive director and chairman of Goldman Sachs International based in London. Can you really leave politics? Excuse me? Is it possible to really leave politics? No, I continue to be passionate about politics, but it's not now my, my profession. Right. Anyone got a question immediately? I'm going to ask Deborah to introduce herself. Please, come forward, because uh, the microphone is here. Can we get the microphone to, to you? Please, Deborah. Uh, good morning. I'm Deborah Wynn Smith. I'm the CEO of the nonpartisan private sector U.S. Council on Competitiveness and also the founding president of the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils. And we're all about understanding the drivers of productivity, inclusive growth, and prosperity. Prosperity. Good. Esko. Um, good morning. My name is Esko. I'm from Finland. I spent uh, roughly 30 years of my life in politics. Uh, I was prime minister in Finland for four years. I was able to lead Finland to the EU. I thought that it's a, it's a challenging effort to be done, but now I understand that getting out is much, much more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> then then I, I've spent the uh, uh, rest of my life uh, with uh, more or less with business. Uh, I'm chairman of the board in a couple of com companies. Uh, I'm a consultant. Uh, when I was in politics, I was wondering what, what the hell is going on in in, in business, and now when I'm on the business side, 
as I am thinking, what the hell is going on in politics? <laughs> Do you have a clear idea? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Okay, thanks. Please, we've got one, one uh, intervention here. Let's, let's go to you. And a second one there. Let's get the microphone here. I want to create 50 minutes of real energy in the room, please, even in an, an auditorium which is not completely full. That's my challenge to you. Please, introduce yourself. That's taxes, taxes, taxes. If the, the, the and the relevance to globalization here, please. Thank you. Please. Anyone, please. Yes. Anyone else? My name is Steve Tommy. I represent the Manager of Company and Farm Nutritioner. I would like to have your opinion on this one also about the future of the European Union, <laughs> particularly about the future situation of eating an after tax, after tax. And we have a, a proposal of sharing of dinners so that we pay the support of Switzerland for a lot of our support. All right, it's going to be. All right, it's going to be for the whole panel, and we've only got 45 minutes, so <laughs> there's a limit to what we can say. Please, who's got the microphone? Where are you from, please? <laughs> Are you saying that really we've got to redefine politics now and politics is way behind the people? Absolutely. All right, that's an important statement, please. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. Who's got the microphone next? And there's a gentleman down here, please. So bring another microphone over here. Thank you. Okay, corporates, corporates, and governance. Okay, over there, please. And the name of your book, John? There you are.
That's a, that's a profound question. Thank you, John. I'll take three more, and then the agenda is going to keep us going until after lunch. So over there, please, and bring the microphones down here. And do you think that that is what's leading to the pushback, particularly against globalization? Okay. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I'll take two more interventions at this stage. Who's got the microphone and then further back? But what's that got to do with globalization particularly? Uh, it's very relevant because Asia is developing slowly. Okay, thank you. Uh, who's da who else down here? The, the gentleman there. Can you get the microphone? Uh, you've got a, you, yes, there's a lady there. Okay, can we get the lady here, please? Uh, th three, four rows back, and then to the left. Thank you. Yes, please. Now, I hope you're writing all these down, panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I'm not shutting down the debate. I, we've got a sample there, panelists, of the kind of issues which are on the minds of those sitting in front of you. Um, it's a formidable list already, but can I ask us to go down the track um, of trying to mold some of these together? Particularly what John said, let's, let's go, this is why having the view from the audience is so important. That particular point of how you measure the advantages of globalization, the, the data, uh, and whether we're making too many assumptions that globalization is great, uh, added, uh, uh, added um, to which the world is moving too fast for the process, and therefore how you take the public with you, how you take the public with globalization. Now, um, Jose Manuel Barroso, those two particular points, please. I think it was exactly right, the point made. The problem, one of the problems with globalization politically is that the, the benefits are not so clear and the costs are, are quite visible and those who are opposing it can make the case much easier than those that are benefiting in general from globalization. Uh, and today what we have is this higher level of anxiety to a large extent because of un globalization. The, in fact, if you look statistically, the world is in a better place now than it was 20, 40 years ago, much better. Hundreds of millions of people uh, left uh, poverty, absolute poverty, including hunger. We are in a much better position in terms of child uh, uh, mortality, in terms of life expectancy, all the social economic indicators show that the world today is better than, let's say, 20 years ago. But there is a redistribution of wealth and power inside our societies and globally, and that creates this level of anxiety. At the same time, the common citizen sees that the governments are not, and also the regulators, including legislation, are not following these changes quickly enough. And so there is a, a perception that uh, there are transnational forces 
uh, that uh, do not respect, of course, uh, borders from, uh, let's say, the financial crisis to international terrorism, including new threats, new technological threats, from uh, uncontrolled migratory uh, movements uh, to um, uh, climate change. So all these phenomena are transnational by nature. They require a much uh, stronger response nationally and globally from a regulatory and from a political point of view. And the perception of the common citizen, either consciously or not, is that it's like you are in a plane, you go to the cockpit and you discover no one is in the cockpit. So there is no control. <laughs> and this creates this anxiety that we see in our societies and this feeding what generally, probably in a simplified way, we call populism. It can be protectionism, it can be nativism, it can be isolationism, sometimes it's even xenophobia. But we have this, uh, let's say, reaction to this trend. So I think what it requires as an answer, making it short, is leadership. Leadership is explaining the issue. It's poli the political forces on the mainstream, let's say the center right to the center left, that have been very much on defensive. If you look at uh, in, even in Europe, we see that now those who are on, on offensive, those who take the initiative, very often are those coming from these extremes, and they are, in some cases, they are winning the argument. Let's be frank about it. At least they have the initiative. So I think those who represent, I, I prefer the moderate forces the reformist forces, not the revolutionary or counter-revolutionary forces, but those who want reforms of our societies should take, retake the initiative, make the case with rational arguments. I continue to believe in democracy. I think that we have enough critical intelligence and arguments to win the debate. Of course, the solution is not to limit the debate, but for that we need a stronger and more committed and I would say also more enlightened leadership. Deborah, okay, more enlightened leadership. And I think, uh, Frank, uh, next year's conference is going to about, be about the challenges of leadership. And there's, <laughs> there is another session going on at this very moment about leadership. So if you think you want to talk about leadership, please don't leave. We'll talk about it too. Um, Deborah, this issue about um, what we've just heard there, but ab about how you sell globalization. Can it be sold if so many out there are believing they have been left behind or set aside by it? Well, you know, the title of this session is The Rebirth of Globalization. I would refer to that really as the transformation because we heard this yesterday, you know, we're living between two great ages. In fact, I would say that the so-called information knowledge age, we've even passed that into this age of illumination. And the institutions and the political systems that we developed after World War II that enabled this tremendous benefit that um, uh, Mr. Barroso has articulated in the world are really in many ways not relevant for the challenges and opportunities today, in large part due to the technology transformation, which is huge, we all know about it, the literacy, the fact that we are so hyper-connected now. So in my view, it's not that globalization is going to stop. It is how are we going to collectively develop a new rule book, a new set of norms and policies to enable this growth and potential that will have a very inclusive basis. And I think one of the challenges that we've seen, certainly in the US, but in Europe and throughout the world, is the dimension of culture and identity. And you know, the view in some quarters that, well, we have this global world, and there's going to be a norm, and everybody's going to you know, react and respond the same way. And as human beings, all of us have grown up in our cultures and in our way of life. Those people who have not been in the mainstream of being global citizens. In fact, I would say almost everyone here is a global citizen by virtue of being here. They feel very threatened. And I think it's our responsibility to one, bring people into this world through tremendous education, but also more understanding. So I'll, I'll give one example in the United States. Um, you know, it was a joke, but it's very serious that during our last presidential election, there was this comment of the flyover country, the majority of the United States being the flyover country. And really, the only people that had the wisdom, the expertise to decide our country were on the East and West Coast, and maybe Chicago. But the fact of it is, our economy, our structures, everything are in the heartland. And so we see this big tension going on, and the positive view on all of this is, I think we are making progress on so many things that even 10 years ago we would not have thought possible. So I know we're going to come back to this. I'm an optimist, but I do think 
that governments are so far behind on adapting the regulatory environments to where we are in technology and business and our social lives. They have to catch up and we're going to have to have new institutions. And finally, you know, this is really, I think, one of the most important things that many of us realize. The U.S. and China, truly, that is a race for the future in terms of not just economic, who has the largest economy, but values, social norms, how we're going to work together. I don't know how many of you saw the recent story, uh, a company called um, Thermo Fisher teamed with a scientist at Yale. They did not know the money came from the Ministry of Security in China, and they sold the equipment and the capability to do the whole DNA sequencing of the Unger population in Western China for authoritarian control. These are things that are moving out at such a fast rate that we have to think of transforming all of our models and systems and recognizing that values and ethics are going to play a huge role in the type of world we create in the future. So your definition is not about rebirth, it is... It's transformation. Transformation of And we're in a process of transition And we mustn't now. forget that particular point about whether politicians are up to it. And about well, what your definition in response to this issue of how, how we define globalization and therefore what we can retrieve of its excellence. Uh, I want to make clear that I'm a company maker, not a policy maker. So my remarks will be in that vein. It's, it's interesting to hear comments about regulation and regulation taking up most of the conversation. For the most part, uh, the seven of the most valuable companies on the planet have been pretty much unregulated, with the exception of perhaps Microsoft in the past. If we look at uh, these companies today, uh, they are born global. Today, Amazon is the second largest employer in the U.S., employing over a half a million people. If you look at job openings here in Lisbon, they're from Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. Many engineering jobs, high-paying jobs. I think there's a perception that these companies are all sort of a fast-moving, careless train, and there is some carelessness in our industry. Uh, we've certainly been in the news. But if you look at some of the innovative approaches these companies have taken, such as Amazon, Amazon hires, has right now about 12,000 job openings for engineers paying $150,000 a year. People that work in Amazon warehouses make $15 to $17 an hour. But Amazon has one of the most innovation, innovative training programs in the world. If you work in that warehouse for one year, they will pay you $12,000 towards an education in one of four sectors that they have found where there are great jobs in transportation, in logistics, in healthcare, uh, in 3D computing. They have brought the technical colleges into their warehouses to teach these classes so that they can immediately offer upward mobility to the lowest paying employees in our country those people in the heartland that we don't talk about, it, big offices in Minneapolis, offices in Missouri, offices in Arkansas. So I think one of the important things here is this leadership capability, the responsibility that these new innovators and these new large companies have to increase the upward mobility, to increase the compensation, to increase the education, that it is really a comment about leadership, not about regulation. But what we've seen in the United Kingdom is many people voting on Brexit, for Brexit, even though it may affect their wealth and their ability to actually have a job. There seems to be this inability to understand how the economic system mm -hmm. works, how wealth is created. Well, there's, it, we had something called the Fairness Doctrine until 1987. And that required all of the mass media, radio and television, to show conflicting views on issues that affected the American public. Unfortunately, the Fairness Doctrine went away under the Reagan administration. And it is very challenging for our global citizens to see a 360 view on any issue today. It's very easy to be polarized or focused on one component of that issue. The ability to think critically, the ability to adapt quickly in a high-velocity world really requires our citizens to have this 360 view 
on issues that are very important and issues that are people are not in agreement on. I think this is probably one of the biggest challenges that we all have, including in the United States. And I would say that people consider the internet the beginning of this issue. It was the elimination of the fairness doctrine. Okay, let's go. Um, particularly on politics, on leadership, uh, the, the point there about the difficulty of politics keeping up with this, the difficulty of regulation keeping up with this. In the end, you have had, uh, along with Jose Manuel Barroso, the experience inside Parliament of trying to drive this stuff through at a speed which matches public expectations. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm thinking about uh, what is the fundamental problem? What, what's, what has went wrong? And uh, I feel that people have lost destination. Destination has disappeared. Uh, in 1970s, 1980s, ordinary citizens had quite clear understanding what kind of role they can play in the, in the future. And, and uh, individual, individual uh, objectives were easily connected with, with the global objectives or national objectives. Now that, that has disappeared. And simultaneously in different parts of the world, not only in the UK, but you can see similar phenomena in almost every corner of the world. And, and populism is, is, is using that opportunity. Nostalgia is everywhere uh, in rise because of that, because of that lack of uh, destination. Why this has happened? This has not happened because of political reasons, but, but mainly because of technological reasons. Technological landscape has completely changed. And our concept, our thinking, our facts, our figures are based on traditional industrial concepts. But we are living in a new context. And now the challenge for politicians and business leaders as well is how to create a new concept which will give back us destination so that we understand what's going on, what, what the objective of our own lives. Could I just challenge you on destination? What about the pushback, the populism, whatever we want to call it, is actually reflecting the fear of many that the destination has changed to their disadvantage, and that's what they're fearful of, and they're pushing back against globalization for? If, when looking at the UK, there are two alternatives now. One is nostalgic one. Let's go back. Let's take our, uh, our authority back and our, our uh, autonomy back. Uh, and that is a nostalgic approach, easy to sell uh, for certain people. Uh, alternative for that is, let's vote again. People went, wrote it wrong, let's vote again. But that's not the... But we're seeing it in so many countries, including Italy, including Hungary, Poland, uh, and so many countries, this fear. Yeah. Therefore, I'm just challenging on destination that there are many, particularly in the lower middle income bra bracket, as we've seen with the Gilets Jaunes, who say, don't tax us, for example, and we'll come on to taxes in a moment. But I'm trying to say that the destination is different now. Destination should be different. People do not have that destination now. And that's why nostalgic forces are so powerful, because they have destination. Mm. They are saying, let's go back to the, to the good, old, good, good old times. Mm. Uh, America great again, or, uh, or, uh, or uh, uh, Turkey great again, or Russia great again. Mm. Similar ideas that, that when destination has disappeared, let's move back, let's take previous generation destinations. Do we all have agreement on that? No, I mean, uh, it depends. Uh, if you want to be honest, let's define what our destination should be. And I can say what I believe should be. Open societies, open economy. I think it's important that the world keeps as much as possible open societies with rule of law, with respect of human dignity, with equality of rights between men and women, with respect for people belonging to minorities, with uh, the fundamental respect for human rights. This is very important. This should be the destination. Now, I admit that the people do not agree with that, but uh, I have to defend what I believe is right. So this is the point. That's why, by the way, why it is important to have a strong European Union, because we have problems in the European Union, but basically the European Union is a force for uh, this destination. That's why it is so important, more important than ever, I would say, to have a strong bond, as was mentioned, between the United States and Europe, because, of course, we uh, Europeans and Americans, we don't agree on all issues, but basically we are committed to open societies and open economies, so I think this should be the destination. And it's true, as Esco said, that 
Sometimes there are some issues about his destination. There is a famous uh, Greek classic thinker that said, when you do not know your port of destination, for you, all the winds are bad. <laughs> the, best, the first thing is to know where we want to go. And so I think this is where we should go. I have three sons, two grandsons. I'd like them to live in a world where liberty, freedom, rule of law, respect for human rights prevail, and not another kind of world. Deborah, you were shaking your head. Well, I think the destination hasn't really changed that much because I think if we ask, you know, ourselves in this room, particularly those that have children or grandchildren, you know, we want our children and grandchildren to have a job, a nice standard of living. I agree on the liberty and the freedom of thought and expression. And the fact that, you know, I look back where I grew up in Akron, Ohio, people that worked in the uh, rubber industry, you know, they had a good standard of living, they sent their children, first generation many, to university. And the fear that globalization has undercut that destination is a big part of what we're seeing. So the extent to which countries and partners can work on these issues of education. I mean, look at the, the college, university situation in the United States. We're very proud that we have students coming from all over the world. You have fabulous universities here in Portugal. But so many children are not getting in to any of these schools with tremendous grades. So the shortage, the fear of scarcity, which I think is really a mistaken fear, is, is driving this. So the destination, people want a job with dignity. And when you take that away, it unleashes all kinds of anxiety. Back to Amazon. You know, I live in Washington, D.C. People in the suburbs are all saying, oh, our house prices have gone up. We're so happy Amazon's there. You know, there was the, the billboard in New York that said, thank you, uh, AOC, you know, our, our new millennial politician star for, for saying goodbye to Amazon. Why didn't Amazon put their headquarters in a part of the country that needed that infrastructure, needed those jobs? Let's go. Jobs are the issue. I, I was born in rural Finland. Uh, when I was born, almost half of Finns were able to get living from uh, agriculture. I knew when I... I started to think about my future. I knew my future is not going to be there. And I saw what I have to do in order to be there where I have to go. And I saw that I'm, I'm doing something which is in line with the objectives of the society. But I, what I want to say, there are too many people now in every corner of the world who cannot find a way like that. They don't know what to do in order to be in the digital future. And uh, I, I agree, we need leadership, but before okay, well, leadership... Let, we, let's pick up that very important point we, of we politics. Need, uh, before leadership, we need a concept. But let me, let me pick up on, the, on, on that important point of politics, when I followed it up and said politics needs to be redefined. We have two per, former prime ministers here. Um, what do you believe needs to happen? Because there's a disillusionment now with the political class, but in this globalization, the failure, apparent failure of globalization, and we heard what Jose Manuel said about the, the fact that there's so much which is good in the world at the moment, the perception is very different. Is polit does politics have a role in this? Uh, Anne, all, all of you quickly, because I've got a lot of things to go through, but uh, it, can politics help or not on uh, transforming globalization rather than just giving it rebirth? From the entrepreneurial standpoint, no. Uh, last year was a bumper crop of investments by venture capitalists. The high number is cited as $300 billion was invested in global companies. There were no politics involved here. It was just finding the best entrepreneurs around the world. 15,000 deals were done. 5,000 new companies were created. That's not a large number. Uh, but and 300 companies emerged as unicorns, meaning having valuations above a billion dollars. There is no discussion in the entrepreneurial community about politics. There is only discussion about opportunity. There's only discussion about invention. There's only discussion about the positive aspects of the future. Clearly, we overestimate the near-term benefits of almost everything we invest in, and we may underestimate the long-term benefits of technology. But it is a system that exists independent of the political landscape at its start. Politics, Deborah. Well, I, I would agree with many of what uh, points Anne is making, except I would say 
that the environment in which you operate and have been so successful is in part because of this innovation-friendly system in which you operate in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. And so the extent to which political leaders can work in their nations to create an innovation-friendly tax system, regulatory environment, on the trade issues that John Chisholm raised. You know, I, I said last year, let's get rid of all tariffs. Tariffs are a 20th century relic that really are not relevant for how the global economy is interconnected. And that, you know, is considered an anathema in many parts of the world. But tariffs are something we don't need, and they have all the consequences that have been described. So I do think enlightened political leadership is necessary, but it can't be divorced from the needs and aspirations of the majority of people in your country. But the point about that question was, can the current political leadership and the current political structures and systems actually provide that leadership now? Building on the regulation question again, the world is moving faster than the, I'll come to you in a moment, let's go, uh, is moving faster than the ability of politics to handle this. Mm. Well, I think this is a huge challenge because, for instance, let's take the area of the CRISPR-9, you know, the gene editing, which tremendous investments going in. That's going to have huge positive ramifications for human health, for agriculture, et cetera. And yet, it's a free-for-all in the world. Is that an area where there needs to be some global consensus of how to deal with that? I think there is, and I think that's going to take supranational leadership. So in many of these, you know, cybersecurity is another one we can talk about, um, moving into the quantum world. So I think some of these technological transformations really are going to mandate a new ethical order for the world. And one of the, the flashbacks going back to the issues with China and the U.S., I recently spoke with one of my former bosses, Secretary of Commerce, U.S. Trade Representative, going back some years, and they all said the same thing kind of over informal lunches. You know, we made a big mistake about China. We thought in the early 90s they would come into the WTO, you know, they would come into this global trading system of norms and things, and they would adapt, but they haven't. They've used that system for a completely different type of development and mercantilism, and it's very, very serious how we're going to deal with that in the world. Okay, well, let Esco and uh, Jose, uh, a mandate for a new ethical order for the world. Again, bring in that question about how fast um, politics can react to the enormity of change and innovation and the, the tension that there is there. Esco. Yeah, in politics, the most difficult thing is to predict the future. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, like in business as well. You are committed to the existing facts and figures, hmm. and it's very difficult to predict. I think we should go back to late 19th century and to look at uh, what happened, in the, especially in the U.S. All these uh, Rockefellers and Carnegies and others who created their own economy, and they said, we don't need any politicians or, or regulators or governments. But the fact is, they need it. And they needed a new concept that was created. Certain kind of welfare thinking was created for that. And uh, popular support was achieved as well. Now we, have, we are moving to digital future. Why companies are saying like you that companies are great to do that on their own? It's not true. They can create uh, entertainment-driven digital world without any governmental interference. But when you move to healthcare, financial services, uh, uh, or education, the fact is that you need governments. I saw an article in, in the New York Times a uh, couple of years ago, five big platform companies saying, government is our biggest enemy. I'd like to ask the same question now. <laughs> uh, are they able to say government is our yeah. biggest enemy? Right. Can Facebook will, this point of view. Facebook Jose, will not given, say like that anymore. Given that you had to sit for 10 years with the representatives of uh, the governments of the uh, mm. European Union, do you believe that uh, they can be sensitized enough, given the enormous pressures on them yeah. politically now, to actually confront this with that kind of enormity that Deborah's put on the agenda? I, I agree with Esco, like the there is a big change there. In fact, recently we have heard Mr. Zuckerberg from Facebook asking the governments to regulate. Yeah, that's right. It's that's amazing. Right. <laughs> because, do you believe and him? this is one of the most successful do you, do you ever. Believe, do you believe him? I believe him. By the way, in Europe we started already doing that. It was my commission who started the general protection, uh, regulation for protection of data. 
uh, I know many people don't like it, but it's much better to have a common rule for the 28 countries than to have each country its own rule. And by the way, the Americans now are thinking about how, how they can regulate some matters in terms of data protection and in privacy terms. So it will happen. So the question is, what kind of regulation? Because there is good regulation and bad regulation. Right. As by the way, about leadership as well, I, when I spoke about leadership earlier, I was not only speaking about political leadership, I mean also corporate leadership. The what is happening today is an issue that puts in question leadership, not only at political level, but at all levels, all levels. There are in fact some authors that speak about the end of power that we believe that we have power, but we don't have power even. We have seen big corporations that disappear. Look, Lehman Brothers disappeared. One day it disappeared. So today the world is much more unpredictable for politics, but also for business, and not only the financial sector, um, all because of disruption that is happening in all sectors of technology. So this is why this is a challenge for leadership, for politicians, for um, uh, corporate leaders, for universities, for academia, for civil society, for, for trade unions, so there is an issue there. Now, I continue to think that democracy is the best system, or the last bad system, if you want, to deal with this. Democracy, by definition, is slow. It's slow. Apparently, it is weaker than authoritarian regimes because it's difficult, more difficult, to define a strategic uh, way. But this is an illusion. In fact, we have seen also authoritarian systems that believe they are very strong. Look at the Soviet Union, and they collapse in some time. And democracies, they are more slow, but they are able to adapt and integrate change and to rationalize a response. So I, I continue to think that the only way to deal with these challenges is through democratic means, through an increased debate, as, pos as much as possible, an informed, rational debate. And of course, we have to address many of the concerns. Some of them are economic, related to technology and others. Some of them are cultural identity issues. What, happen, what happens in some of our countries today is not so much about the economy, because the economy is going, going much better today. All the Central Eastern European countries, if you compare the, their economy today, is incomparably better than 10 or 20 years ago. But, but they have concerns because of identity, because of foreigners, because of different religions, different cultures. So there are many issues that require this enlightened leadership. But, but many in the public do not see it that way. They do not, do not see that things are much, much better. And that yeah. surely is the, it's like a Rubik's Cube. You can get one side of six in place, but you can't get the rest together. And the public is very impatient and anxious yes, at I the same time. Yes, uh, Nick, I, but Nick I, say, I said economically, it's, 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 not, it's a fact. It's not an opinion. I mean, when we have, for instance, in my country, economic and social, I mean, you, you spoke about your, your past in, in Portugal, when we had a revolution in 74, only 60% of the people had access to drinkable water. Today, it's almost 100%. Portugal today has uh, child mortality figures or life expectancy that are indeed better than the United States of America on average. And this was possible through, thanks to the European Union. If you compare Poland today, how it was before in the communist times, my God, Poland is doing exceptionally way, uh, well. And if you compare Poland with Ukraine, you see a big difference. So in fact, from an economic and social point of view, we are much better. But there are, on average. But of course, there are redistributions, and that creates these this difficulties, namely because of the inequality that is growing in our societies, and also because of the anxiety that is because about the future, namely those structural transformations we are seeing, All right, okay. not only uh, uh, technologically, but also culturally, and with identity challenges. All right, we've got 10 minutes to transform globalization. I'm being driven by many of your questions. We had 10 questions at the beginning, so let's try and go down uh, some of them very quickly. The issue right at the beginning on taxes, and look at the backlash there was in France over the diesel tax rise. Uh, the taxes are part of the perception problem on globalization. Quick answer from any of you. Anne, Deborah? Well, certainly in the US, moving to a territorial tax system to be able to repatriate foreign profits has had a huge impact on our economy and on our job creation. There certainly is a debate on how much personal taxes there should be in terms of the extreme wealth versus the middle class. I don't think that will go away. But tax is an important uh, policy tool that leaders use. Um, I want to give one example of an ethical company, though, that's leading the future, that's a European company, um, but global, and that's Royal Dutch Shell. And the chairman of Royal Dutch Shell, first time's an American, Chad Holliday, if you hear him talk, they are already talking about the future. They have a whole strategy for a decarbonized world. The investments they're making, the things they're doing with their infrastructure, 
they're already making huge bets on moving beyond fossil fuels. And to me, that's a huge example, back to what Anne was saying, about private sector leadership that can use its wealth and capability to address some of these huge global challenges, such as climate. But taxes are an important policy tool. Anything else on taxes? Anyone? Let's go. Uh, I, I, I agree. Taxes will p play a big role. And I, th I think we need certain level of uh, Were you shocked role? by the pushback on the diesel tax in France and what it led to? 80% of the country uh, angry over a, a modest rise for sustainable. reasons. I think reasons. it's an identification of, uh, of, about the fact that there is no common understanding about the destination. If you don't understand where we are going to go, you will try to keep what you have as long as possible. Okay. Anything else on taxes? Anne? No. No. Okay. The question there about innovation. I can't, I can't really adequately summarize it, but the environment to innovate and the, the difficulties we've been hearing in the skills session, and obviously many have been talking about it beforehand, about how the, those who are, are working are going to have to completely reinvent themselves frequently now. And the fact that people are not going to have a job for life is already leading to a backlash on globalization. Hang on, you gave me a job. I should be there for the rest of my working life. Well, I think there is a glass half full and a glass half empty dialogue here. Uh, the glass half full is university and college graduates today are being taught adaptability. Critical thinking is more important than any particular functional skill. Um, they might have a greater salary if they're a STEM graduate versus a humanities graduate, but they're, they're trained to be adaptable and they're trained to think globally. Retraining a 45 to 55 year old who has had that single job remains a big challenge. Uh, the type of education they had was probably not global. The type of, of functional orientation they had makes them less adaptable. And that should be one of the focuses we have. We do have an aging population. I don't worry about the millennials. I really don't. I think they are extremely adaptable, extremely global. global. When we fund companies uh, in the enterprise software area, the average age of the entrepreneur starting an enterprise software company is not 25. It's closer to 40. So there is strong proof that entrepreneurs can exist at any age. And this backbone of an entrepreneurial economy is something we need to bring to all age groups. I think that remains an opportunity and a challenge for us. Back to the question about uh, access to capital for everyone, which I think was the question posed by uh, the young woman. It, it is a challenge. If we look at all that 300 billion that was invested last year, 30% of it went to China. 60% of it went to the US. In the US, it went to four out of 50 states. Only seven to 8% went to Europe. Uh, capital is getting scarcer and scarcer for entrepreneurs in Europe. It's becoming extremely risk averse. If we look at most of the capital that went to European companies, it was later stage, not early stage. And I do think that this is a challenge for all the Europeans here is to expand their risk envelope. I was recently in Finland and met with entrepreneurs there, very hot area, Scandinavia, for risk. And that is a challenge also in retraining our older population that they too can be entrepreneurs. Could I check, uh, have a check in with all of you then? If I understand you correctly, Anne, what you're saying is that in many ways this pushback against globalization is a, a moment of transition and it's probably more negative at the moment than it will be because of the next gen. And you're, you're nodding, Deborah. Absolutely. I, I agree completely. It is transition right now. Transitions, I mean, look through human history, moving from farms into industry. There's always that period, and that's mm -hmm. what we're in. But before we leave, I just want to remind everybody about one important date this year. And you mentioned 50 states. It's the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 landing on the moon. I just came back from Australia and had the fabulous opportunity to go to one of the NASA deep space communication centers, Australia, Spain, and the Mojave Desert, and what we actually watched the communication of the farthest um, probes out in the universe. Think of the innovation that has occurred in the last 15 years. 1969, the first ARPANET. 
you know, Seiko's Court Watch, on and on and on, and all the cultural changes that have gotten us to where we are today. And if you only think 50 years in the future, going back to Apollo being the prophetic person at Delphi, <laughs> what, what, what is the world going to be? I'm very optimistic yeah. about the innovation future. I, I think that, uh, uh, as Paul just said now, I think the word is transition. We are in a phase of transition, not only in technology, not only, but also in globalization, in the redistribution of global health, wealth, and power. The challenges to the global order, and this creates this anxiety, angst, as they say in German, about about the future. So, part of the solution, I mean, part of the problem problem is the perception of technology and science. But I think science and education are the answer. I think it's the more educated people that we can adapt to these new challenges critical thinking, training, and I think, by the way, in that matter, we have to do more all over the world, certainly in Europe. In Europe, we are doing, I, I, I'm now teaching in two universities in Europe, here in Portugal and Switzerland, but also I was, when I left the commission in Princeton, to almost two years, before at Georgetown, and there is, in fact, there are some differences. I think that in the United States, their culture is more open to risk and innovation than in Europe in general. That's, I think, fair to recognize. On, a, uh, on what I can compare. In Europe, there are other issues because of the fragmentation of our market. So when a, a company, when there is a startup in the United States, they, they look immediately at the United States and the world. In Europe, we have 28 different digital markets. This is completely absurd, in spite of all the efforts that the European commissioners are doing. So that makes it more difficult. So sometimes our best talent goes to the United States precisely because here there is not enough uh, let's say, uh, ecological, let's say, support um, from the, to this innovation. So, but we need more. China is investing extremely strongly in these areas, like artificial intelligence. And so I think, in general, we need to do more in terms of science and technology. That's why I'm proud that my commission have done something in terms of more than 80 billion euros 80, 80 for this program known right. as Horizon 2020. I hope that now the European Union will keep and reinforce its commitment, supporting the efforts done also at national level for more science and more education in Europe. All right, let's have a, a moment of, of, of clarity then as we enter the last five minutes, just picking up on what Anne said, that we're in a moment of transition, and I think you're all agreeing. Does that mean when it comes to globalization, if we're into transformation, and I've written it down here, are we talking about a redefinition of wealth and a redefinition of anxiety and expectations? Esco? Yeah, I, I think this is most relevant issue to be discussed. What's going on? What, what are the most relevant things to take place? And I have two comments on that. For the first, we have to understand that there is no change without crisis. I've seen that in both in politics and business. And if you don't have any crisis atmosphere and feeling, it's very, very difficult to get reforms to be done. And that's why I'm not that much worried about these turbulences. These turbulences are, let's say, inevitable. They are necessary in order to get something new to be done. And secondly, and this is my most important message, we have to understand what is the most fundamental change when we are moving from industrial into digital. And that is, we are moving from standardized into personalized way of life. And that is fundamental. We have seen that already in media and politics. But we have not yet seen that in other sectors of the society. And that is, uh, uh, Mr. Barroso, I think this is the fundamental thing with the politics as well. We are still living with these standardized solutions. We believe that when politicians are doing the right kind of map for, for the society, then everyone is ready to, to make the right calls. We have to understand that we are moving to totally different kind of the yeah. world. Look at healthcare, for example. Healthcare is going to be revolutionized, and the idea is that it is going to be completely personal in the yeah. future. But I we are not yet there. I think the changes in media, I think this point is extremely important. I don't think, I want to make this point clear, I don't think that by definition, the politicians of the past were better than the politicians of today. This yeah. is a, a typical optical illusion, the idealization of the past. I started very early as a foreign minister. I worked in the same European Council with Helmut Kohl, François Mitterrand, Jacques, those people that we consider today, oh, this was the golden age. No. The, today, the constraints on political leaders are much stronger than before, partly because of media. That's right. 
the social media. So the, the communication system has changed dramatically. And from that point of view, I think some disruptions are taking place in terms of this intermediation of communication. And I, then I agree that most of the politicians have not yet learned to deal with this new context of communication. That is changing completely. And I agree with you completely. It's no longer the standardization. It's much more the personal communication, not only for uh, the political actor as a brand, but also the way to communicate to each person and not just to some categories. So we are seeing also, from a communication media point of view, we are also seeing some very interesting disruption, and we are in that uh, phase now. Which and of to course combine is to that with the globalization uh, is yes. very, very tough. Right. One last point um, in the time remaining, because uh, Isabel Maxwell raised this about women, uh, about um, uh, women's equal rights, and that being at the heart of much of the disillusionment still about globalization. We had a shocking report a few days ago, it happened to be in the United Kingdom, that actually the pay gap between men and women is widening as opposed to narrowing. In other words, is that still a desperate hangover which is affecting the transformation on globalization, Deborah? Well, I'll just start with the United States. In my lifetime, it has not only been transitional, but it's been transformational. And, you know, women are really at the height of the game across industry and government. We have more women in our Congress than ever. Industry, presidents of universities. I mean, the CEOs of our major defense contractors are all women. Um, I think this whole Me Too movement is really recognizing that we're living in a world, back to transition and transformation, of total transparency. And you have to have trust in a world of transparency where everything is really very well known very quickly. So on the issue of women, I think it's not how fast it's going to be, but that it's here. And those countries and those regions that do not bring women into the total mainstream are going to be left behind. They're going to be left behind. There's no question. I, inclusion has been a big topic of this conference over the last couple days, and it's not just inclusion of women, it's inclusion of everyone. And I think that has to be part of the conversation. Um, women have gotten quite vocal about this, and I agree with Deborah. Um, Deborah and I have seen many changes in our own lifetime in venture capital. More and more women are starting venture capital firms realizing that they can assume the leadership role first versus grow into the role. So there are many big steps being made, but inclusion has to include not just women, but everyone is a global citizen. And I think we'll hear different voices at different times group together and have their own Me Too movement, but I'm satisfied that we as a group here are really not forgetting that inclusion is very important. Back to the, the funding, issue. I mentioned that only four states received most of the venture capital, or started most of the companies. It doesn't matter if you are a Caucasian, a woman, a person of color in Ohio, you probably had a hard challenge getting venture capital because you weren't in California, Seattle, San Francisco, Boston, or New York. So it is not inclusive right now, the opportunity field, and we need to be working on that And that is everywhere. affecting globalization and the perception, is it? Absolutely. Okay. Look, uh, may, I, may I comment briefly, women's role. I'm, I'm concerned about women's role in the society and economy today, but on the longer term, I'm extremely worried about young men, boys and young men. The standardized system in education is killing opportunities for young men. And we are seeing first indications of that. You, you can do that, you can do that, but look at the figures already now. If you look at the dropout figures in the United States and in European countries, you can see that phenomenon already now. And it's getting worse. It's getting worse. Sorry to say it. Um, I, let, I was about to say I'm going to be in trouble if I stop this discussion now. <laughs> Can we get the microphone up there quickly? Yeah, um, I think, I think, I think one, one, one thing I would add on that, though, is if we look at the STEM graduates, uh, and certainly not everybody should be a STEM graduate, but in the United States, the percentage of STEM graduates that are women has not been increasing 
uh, when I graduated as a STEM graduate, uh, there were, I was, 12% of our class was women. Today, at the average university, not an MIT or a Stanford, only 14% of the STEM graduates are women. You look at that number in Germany, it's less than 10. So the high paying job. It's today, it's today, but. Yes. Uh, Can I just get that one contribution and please understand that we do have time constraints, but I'm delighted to be able to uh, ask you to speak. Um. Could it, all right, um, can we take five more minutes? Uh, could I just make a point? I don't know if you were here at the beginning, but I did get all the audience, as many as I could, to set the agenda for this, and no question was asked about Africa. Okay, thank you. All right. Yeah. But that on that can point I, about Africa, I, please do, yeah. I think you are completely right, but probably it's our fault, but look, frankly, we were speaking about the most important, uh, let's say, global players today. And the reality is, let's be honest about it, that today in the world, economically, there are three great poles, United States, China, and Europe. Even countries like Japan or uh, Brazil, that are very powerful economically, they are not at the same level of global influence. Africa, I'm a strong believer in Africa. By the way, if you want to come here in July in the same place, I'm the chairman of the European Africa um, um, Summit or Forum. We organize it here in Kashkai, in this very venue. So I'm working for, uh, in African matters for many, many years. I'm a great supporter, personally, of stronger involvement of uh, uh, Europe and uh, basically Europe, um, because that's what I've been working with in Africa. But the reality is that today, Africa is not playing the role it could and should be doing. Partly because Africa has been less open than other parts of the world. Partly because, not only because of it, because of some uh, very old problems, including, of course, the legacy of colonialism, but also because of the lack of openness. While we compare, for instance, parts of Asia has been able to open much more than, than Africa. Now, I continue to think that the biggest reserve of growth in the future for the world will come from Africa because of dimension and the dynamism of its population. So, uh, in fact, while many uh, Asian economies are now coming to what we can call maturity, comparable to the Western economies, the so-called old industrial world, in Africa, this is not yet the case, but this also defines an opportunity. So I agree with you, and I f take, uh, of course, uh, your critic uh, criticism seriously, that we should devote more time and more intellectual also uh, resources to Africa because, and because this is critically important, not only for the Africans themselves, but also for global uh, growth. Thank you. Can I tell you, tell you that there is a lunch about to start on Namibia, and uh, there is a session on Africa. I, I have lost it here on the, in the Nairobi room tomorrow. So I hear what you're saying, and thank you for putting it on the agenda. And I'm really sorry that I've got to stop the discussion now but we did get a lot of questions at the beginning and most of them have been answered. We just couldn't tackle the future of the European Union in the time available. So thank you all very much indeed and have a good lunch.